platform. Sutra. With the commentary of Tripitaka Master Hawa. English translation by the Buddhist text. Translation Society. Buddhist Text Translation Society Dharma Realm Buddhist University Dharma Realm Buddhist Association Berlin Game, California USA The Eight Guidelines of the Buddhist Text Translation Society 1. A volunteer must free him slash herself from the motives of personal fame and profit. 2. A volunteer must cultivate a respectful and sincere attitude free from arrogance and conceit. 3. A volunteer must refrain from aggrandizing his slash her work and denigrating that of others. 4. A volunteer must not establish him slash herself as the standard of correctness and suppress the work of others with his or her fault finding. 5. A volunteer must take the Buddha mind as his slash her own mind. 6. A volunteer must use the wisdom of Dharma selecting vision to determine true principles. 7. A volunteer must request virtuous elders in the ten directions to certify his slash her translations. 8. A volunteer must endeavor to propagate the teachings by printing sutras, shastra texts, and vinaya texts when the translations are certified as being correct. Happily Dwelling Conduct Happily Dwelling Conduct is the Bodhisattva Conduct, and the Bodhisattva Conduct is itself the Happily Dwelling Conduct. One happily dwells in the doors of practice cultivated by bodhisattvas. Both one's body and one's mind reside in the states of cultivation of the bodhisattva way, and do so happily, since that is what one likes to do. Editor's Introduction The Sixth Patriarch's Dharma Jewel Platform Sutra is the fundamental text of Chan Buddhism. It relates the life and teachings of Master Huawei. Neng, the Great Master the Sixth Patriarch as set down by one of his disciples. During the 7th and 8th centuries under the Tang dynasty, Master Hui Neng taught the doctrines of no thought and of sudden enlightenment, which, as expounded in this text, continue to be the heart of Chan wherever it is practiced. As such, these are the only teachings of a Chinese high monk which are regarded by Buddhists as a sutra, that is, as a sacred text equal to those compiled by the earlier South Asian masters. Interest in Buddhism in general and in Chan in particular is now swiftly growing in the West, especially in America. Translations and retranslations of many of the central Buddhist texts have been appearing in consequence. A good deal of confusion has been an unfortunate byproduct. Because Chan is so foreign to traditional Western thought, the rendering of Chan teachings into a Western language requires, even in the most literal translation, the virtual invention of a new vocabulary of concepts, and each new translation has tended to present a distinctly different rendition of the central Buddhist ideas. To elucidate them, commentaries are often added by the translators. But all of these translations and commentaries have been written by scholars who are not Buddhists. While that kind of non-membership is hardly important to a translator of ordinary philosophical writings, it becomes a severe stumbling block for the translator of Chan teachings. For Chan is not a system of thought at all, but a special kind of moral and psychological work, aimed at a particular personal transformation which the Buddhists call Enlightenment. Only one who through difficult practice has undergone that transformation can hope to teach Chan authoritatively and translate and comment on the sayings of other masters without having to resort to guesswork about what the sayings mean. Fortunately for students of the way, an effort to establish an authoritative Buddhist canon in English has now been undertaken by Tripitaka Master Suan Hua and his American disciples. Master Hua stands in the direct line of orthodox Buddhist leadership as it has been handed down from the time of Shakyamuni Buddha. The present translation of the Sixth Patriarch's Sutra, here presented in its second edition, was the first work of Master Hua to appear in America. The first edition appeared in 1971. The translation itself was carried out under the Master's supervision by the Buddhist Text Translation Society, composed of the Master's disciples who are scholars both of the Chinese language and of Buddhism. With his Western readers in mind, the Master has provided a running commentary to the Sutra text. The commentary was first spoken in a series of lectures in 1969. The master's sure and witty manner of making the most difficult concepts plain, already well known to Buddhists on both sides of the Pacific, 
has been rendered in English by his disciples with an eye to retaining the lively spoken style of the original. In his commentary, Master Hua's method is to read a few lines from the sutra text and then expound upon their meaning or expand on the doctrines in question, often by reference to Contemporary American Problems This style of exposition follows the tradition of lecturing sutras that has existed in China for many centuries. Until the appearance of this volume in its first edition, there had been in the West little or no record or even description of the verbal teachings of Buddhism. The present volume serves as a rare example of Buddhism in action, as it has survived intact through the centuries. Yopasaka Kuojo Rounds Buddhist Text Translation Society, San Francisco, 1977 Biography of the Venerable Master Discovering and perfecting the method to extricate living beings from the most fundamental problem of human existence that of birth and death has been the primary focus of the Venerable Master Suen Hua's life. On the 16th day of the third lunar month in 1908, his mother saw Amitabha Buddha emitting a light which illumined the entire world, and when she awoke from this dream she gave birth to the Venerable Master. A rare fragrance lingered in the room following her dream and throughout the birth. The Master's initial awareness of death came at eleven years old when he saw a lifeless infant. The realization that death and birth follow upon one another without cease and that both bring suffering, pain and sorrow, awakened a profound sense of compassion in the Master and prompted his immediate resolution to leave the home life and learn to bring an end to the cycle of birth and death. He honored his mother's wishes that he remains at home to serve his parents until their deaths, however. The following year on Guanyin Bodhisattva's birthday, he dreamed that an old woman wearing a patchwork robe and a string of beads appeared to guide him through a wilderness in which he was lost. She radiated compassion as she led him over the road which was gutted with deep and dangerous holes. He knew that if he had tried to traverse this road alone it would have been difficult if not impossible to reach safety, but as she guided him, the road became smooth and safe and he could see clearly. In all directions. Ahead was his home. Glancing back on the dangerous road, he saw many people following him old and young, men and women, sangha, and scholars. Who are those people, he asked, where did they come from and where are they going? They have affinities with you, she said, and they also want to go home. You must guide them well and show them the way so that you may all arrive at Nirvana. I have important work to do elsewhere, and so I shall leave you now, but soon we shall meet again. The master asked her name and where she lived. You will find out when you arrive home, she said. There's no need to ask so many questions. Suddenly she whirled around and disappeared. The master led the people safely home and woke from his dream feeling extremely happy. During that same year he began bowing to his parents three times each, in the morning and evening twelve bows a day. Then he thought the world is bigger than just my father and mother, and he began to bow to the heavens, to the earth, to the emperor, and to his teachers as well. He also bowed to his master, even though he had not yet met him. The master knew that without the aid of a good knowing advisor, it is impossible to cultivate, and he felt that he would meet his master soon. He also bowed to the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Pratyeka Buddhas, and Arhats, and to all the good people in the world to thank them for AL1 the good deeds they had done, he bowed on behalf of the people they had helped. Evil people are to be pitted, he thought, and he bowed for them, asking that their karmic offenses might be lessened and that they might learn to repent and reform. When doing this, he thought of himself as the very worst offender. Each day he thought of new people to bow for and soon he was bowing 837 times in the morning and 837 times in the evening, which took about three hours a day in all. The master didn't let others see him bow. He rose at four in the morning, washed his face, went outside, lit a stick of incense, and bowed, regardless of the weather. If there was snow on the ground, he would just bow in the snow. In the evening, long after everyone was asleep, he went outside and bowed again. He practiced this way every day for six years. During these years his filial devotion became known far and wide and he was referred to as filial son Pai. Nor did his filial devotion end at the death of his parents. 
On the day his mother was buried, he remained behind after the ceremonies were completed to begin a three-year vigil beside her grave. Shortly after, he left his mother's grave long enough to go to three. Conditions Temple at Pying Fang Station south of Harbin to receive the Shramanara precepts from Great Master Chong Chi. He then returned to his mother's grave and built a 5 by 8 hut out of 5 inch sorghum stalks which kept out the wind and rain but actually set up little distinction between inside and outside. He commenced to observe the custom of filial piety by watching over his mother's grave for a period of three years. Clothed only in a rag robe, he endured the bitter Manchurian snow and blazing summer sun. He ate only one meal a day, when there was food. And he simply did not eat if no food was offered to him. He never lay down to sleep. At the side of the grave, the master read many sutras. When he first read the Lotus Sutra, he jumped for joy. He knelt and recited it for seven days and seven nights, forgetting to sleep, forgetting to eat, until eventually blood flowed from his eyes and his vision dimmed. Then he read the Shurangama Sutra, thoroughly investigating the Great Samadhi and quietly cultivating it, the three stoppings, the three contemplations, neither moving, nor still. The Master relates of this experience. I began to obtain a single-minded profound stillness, and penetrate the noumenal state. When I read the Avatamsaka, the enlightenment became boundless in its scope, indescribable in its magnificence, unsurpassed in its loftiness, and ineffable in its clarity. National Master Ching Liang said, Opening and disclosing the mysterious and subtle, understanding and expanding the mind and its states, exhausting the principle while fathoming the nature, penetrating the result which includes the cause. Deep and wide, and interfused. Vast and great and totally complete. It is certainly so. It is certainly so. At that time I could not put down the text, and bowed to and recited the Great Sutra as if it were clothing from which one must not part or food which one could not do without for even a day. And I vowed to myself to see to its vast circulation. When his filial duties were completed, the master went into seclusion in Amitabha cave in the mountains east of his hometown. There he delved deeply into Dhyana meditation and practiced rigorous asceticism, eating only pine nuts and drinking spring water. The area abounded with wild beasts, but they never disturbed the master. In fact, wolves and bears behaved like house pets, tigers stopped to listen to his teaching, and wild birds gathered to hear the wonderful Dharma. After his stay in the mountains, the master returned to Three Conditions Monastery where he helped the Venerable Master C. H. Ang Chi and the Venerable Master C. H. Ang Zhen, to greatly expand the monastery, while simultaneously devoting his time to the propagation of the Dharma. For more than three decades in Manchuria, the master adhered strictly to ascetic cultivation, diligently practiced Dhyana meditation, and worked tirelessly for the expansion and propagation of the Dharma. During those years, he visited many of the local Buddhist monasteries, attended intensive meditation and recitation sessions, and walked many miles to listen to lectures on the sutras, in addition to lecturing on the sutras himself. He also visited various non-Buddhist religious establishments and obtained a thorough grounding in the range of their specific beliefs. In 1946 the master made a major pilgrimage, which took him to Puto Mountain to receive the complete precepts in 1947. Then in 1948, after 3,000 miles of travel, the master went to Nanhua Monastery and bowed before the Venerable Master Hsu Yun the 44th Patriarch from Shakyamuni Buddha. At that first meeting the Venerable Master Yun, who was then 109 years old, recognized the Master to be a vessel worthy of the Dharma and capable of its propagation. He sealed and certified the Master's spiritual skill and transmitted to him the wonderful mind-to-mind -mind seal of all Buddhas. Thus the Master became the 45th generation in a line descending from Shakyamuni. Buddha the 19th generation in China from Bodhidharma, and the 9th generation of the Wei Yang lineage. Of their meeting the Master has written. The Noble Yun saw me and said, Thus it is. I saw the Noble Yun and verified, Thus it is. The Noble Yun and I, both thus. 
universally vow that all beings will also be thus. The mind-to-mind -mind transmission is performed apart from the appearance of the spoken word. Apart from the mark of the written word, apart from the characteristic of the conditioned mind apart from all such appearances. Only sages who have genuine realization understand it, ordinary people have no idea what is happening. It is a mutual recognition of the embodiment of the principle of true suchness. Nearly eight years later, in May of 1956, the Venerable Yun sent to the Master a document entitled The Treasury of the Orthodox Dharma I, the Source of Buddhas and Patriarchs. The document bears the seals of Yun Chu Monastery and of the Venerable Yun. It serves as tangible and public certification of the transmission of the mind to mind seal from the Venerable Yun to the Master which took place during their initial meeting in 1948. In 1950 the master resigned his post at Nanhua Monastery as the director of the Nanhua Institute for the Study of the Vinaya, and journeyed to Hong Kong where he lived in a mountainside cave in the New Territories. He stayed in the cave until the large influx of Sangha members fleeing the mainland required his help in establishing new monasteries and temples throughout Hong Kong. He personally established two temples in a lecture hall and helped to bring about the construction of many others. He dwelt in Hong Kong for twelve years, during which many people were influenced by his arduous cultivation and awesome manner to take refuge with the Triple Jewel, cultivating the Dharmador of recitation of the Buddha's name, and to support the propagation of the Buddha Dharma. In 1962 the Master carried the Buddha's Dharma banner farther west to the shores of America where he took up residence in San Francisco, sat in meditation, and waited for past causes to ripen and bear their fruit. In the beginning of the year 1968 the Master declared that the flower of Buddhism would bloom that year in America with five petals, in the summer of that year the Master conducted the Shurangama Sutra Dharma Assembly which lasted 96 days five of the people who attended that session left the home life and became pictures and Pictionese under the Masters. Guidance. Since that time more than 20 people have left the home life under his guidance. Since 1968 the Master has delivered complete commentaries on the Heart Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, the Sixth Patriarch Sutra, the Amitabha Sutra, the Sutra of the Past Vows of Earth Store Bodhisattva, the Great Compassion Heart Dharani Sutra, the Dharma Flower Sutra, the Sutra in 42 sections, the Shramanara Vinaya and others. In June of 1971, the Master commenced a Dharma assembly on the King of Sutras, the Avatamsaka. With such tireless vigor, the Master has firmly planted the roots of Dharma in Western soil so that it can become self-perpetuating. He has spent many hours every day explaining the teachings and their application to cultivation, steeping his disciples in the nectar of Dharma that they might carry on the Buddha's teachings. The miraculous events that have taken place in the Master's life are far too numerous to relate in this brief sketch. This is but a brief outline of how the Master has worked with selfless devotion to